Well, open your testaments to uh, page 183. That's what it is in mind. That's the last chapter of the what we call the book of Romans. As you know, it's uh, actually a letter that Paul wrote to his brethren in Rome. We do not have in the first four books of the New Testament, the first five books of the New Testament, an author that is stated. We believe we... Uh, have the right names on those books though, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts. But starting with the Romans letter, or the book of Romans, almost all of the rest of the New Testament books have a name affixed to them in the text itself. And this, of course, is the first one. Paul identifies himself as... Uh, a servant or slave, bond servant of Jesus Christ, but as an apostle according to the will of Christ. And he addresses it, verse 7, to uh, the beloved of God in Rome, called to be saints. And that's simply another way of saying to the church at Rome. It's generally assumed that Paul... <clears throat> wrote this in about 57 or 58 of the first century, A.D. first century. And um, there are some indications in the book that this is so. Chapter 15, <clears throat> verse 25, 24, 25, along in there, speaks of the collection for the poor in uh, Jerusalem that churches in Macedonia and Achaia, that's another word for Greece, those churches had collected money to be sent back to Jerusalem for a special problem of poverty. We don't know what caused it among uh, Christians in Jerusalem. So uh, we can identify that fact that they're taking the money back, that money has been collected with the events in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20, where brethren from each one of these uh, supporting congregations met in the city of Troas as they were on their way back to Jerusalem. Remember, Paul would not handle all these funds or any of these funds himself, lest someone accuse him of uh, not handling them honorably and honestly. And so uh, he had each congregation choose a brother with whom they would entrust their respective funds, and they all took it back to Jerusalem together. So <clears throat> we can uh, date things, backdate things in the book of Acts to about that time that Paul would have been uh, on his way back, starting back to Jerusalem on the uh, last trip he made back there. Uh, another thing that helps us somewhat with the uh, dating of the book of Acts <clears throat> and belief that it was written from Corinth as he was starting that journey back is the um, list of evils that we see in the last half of the first chapter of Romans. Uh, Corinth had... Uh, the city of being the most corrupt, morally corrupt city on the face of the map in the first century. And there was any, uh, even a term that was used to uh, refer to someone who was very dissolute morally, to call him a Corinthian. People in the first century would know what you meant. He just has no morals whatsoever. Or to Corinthianize someone or something was to corrupt it. So here's Paul writing this vivid, graphic list and description of evil in the first chapter of Romans. And it's almost as if Paul is giving us photographic pictures of what he is seeing as he is writing this letter. Paul didn't actually write this letter himself. The 16th chapter of Romans which is the very 
closing chapter, verse uh, 22 says, I, Tertius, who write the epistle, salute you in the Lord. So Paul was using a secretary. He was dictating this epistle, apparently. The uh, theological term for a secretary, as Paul would have used, is an amanuensis. But we identify with the secretary a whole lot better. So here is someone that is doing the writing for Paul. As he is, I can almost see him facing up and down in whatever apartment he lived in. And here is Tertius over here at a desk. And, and Paul is saying what we have in the Romans letter and Tertius, the scribe, is writing it down. And um, it likely was delivered not by UPS or FedEx, not even by a postal service, but by a lady that's mentioned in the first two verses of the 16th chapter. Paul wrote, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church that is at Sincrea, that ye receive her in the Lord, assist her in whatsoever matters she may have need of uh, you, for she herself also hath been a helper of many and of mine own self. It seems as if Paul is sending this letter by her and commending her to them as uh, worthy of their reception and their fellowship. That was the way most epistles were delivered in the first century by a special messenger who would take it. What were the purposes of Paul writing this letter? Well, he doesn't uh, graphically state it as John does in his uh, gospel account. But we can determine from the content, at least to some degree, why he wrote it. In chapter 1, verses uh, 11 and 13, he says that he wants to come to see them, that he might impart some spiritual gift to them. So he had this desire to come to them and give them some spiritual gifts. Now, if we didn't have the word spiritual in there, we might think, well, he's going to take them some clothes or, or take them something else. But no, these were spiritual gifts, and that's identified with what Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he lists nine gifts of the Spirit such as gift of prophecy, gift of healing, gift of miracles, gift of tongues, gift of interpretation of tongues, and so forth. We don't know which of those gifts he wanted to impart to them, but it is significant that, number one, they apparently didn't have any of these gifts, that no apostle had been there before, of course, Roman Catholicism says that uh, Peter established the church in Rome. And uh, if that were so, it's so strange that uh, Paul would not greet Peter if he were there. Well, maybe he hadn't gotten there yet. Somebody said, no, Catholic Church says he's the one that got there and established the church, and church is already in existence. So... Uh, that, of course, is a fable. There is no historical uh, uh, evidence to back it up. Not a, not a fable, but a tradition and a myth. We just don't know who established the church in Rome. That's not given us. But no person, even if they possessed these spiritual gifts, could pass these gifts on to others. They may have had some people in Rome that had some of the spiritual gifts, but they could not uh, provide them for others. Only the apostles could do that through the laying on of their hands. And that's made very evident by noticing Acts chapter 6, and then Acts chapter 8, and then Acts chapter 19, and then uh, some things that Paul wrote to Timothy about uh, the gifts that he had given to Timothy by the laying on of his hands. And now this... There were gifts Paul wanted them to have, but they could not get them through anyone else's hands besides an apostles. So indirectly, we have that uh, fact confirmed that only through the apostles could the gifts be transmitted. 
in this statement of what Paul desires to do for them when he visits them. He uh, writes to tell them of his plans to come to see them. In chapter 15, uh, he talks about his plans, uh, verse 24, of going into Spain. And he says, as I go unto Spain, I'm going to come through Rome and visit you. And he actually says, I hope you'll help me on my way. He was uh, planting the seed to raise uh, the support that he needed to go on to Spain. Paul was never content to uh, sit around and wait for people to come to him. And he was not content to go to places where others had preached the gospel. He wanted to go into new territory all the time. And uh, as far as we know, nobody had made it all the way to Spain, uh, extreme Western Europe. And that's where he wanted to push the borders of the kingdom even further. So he uh, wants to tell them of his plans. I'm coming your way and going on into Spain. So that was a part of the purpose for his writing. But I think overall, the great purpose of his writing is seen in mainly the doctrinal content of the book. It is generally acclaimed to be the most profound book in all of the Bible. The uh, depths of the uh, reasoning and the thinking that are in it and the way he sets forth the scheme of redemption, we're justified by faith as its theme, are indeed... uh, from a mind that uh, is capable of great depth of thought. And it's a challenging book. It's written, for the most part, in literal terms, not a great deal of figurative speech in it. Revelation is a challenging book because it's almost altogether figurative language. But uh, Paul doesn't deal in a whole lot of figures in Romans. He just lays it out there and argues from that which is literal and factual in uh, outlining and setting forth the scheme of redemption. Now back to uh, where did the church in Rome and how did the church in Rome begin? Three things that have been uh, postulated as uh, who may have begun it. When we read on Pentecost of those who were gathered there, Verses uh, 9 and 10, I believe it is, list about uh, 15 or 16 different areas of the world from which they came. And the last of those says, and sojourners from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. So we know that there were pilgrims, Jewish pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem to observe the Pentecost feast. Probably they came for the Passover first and just stayed over until the Pentecost feast, which was seven weeks plus a day after Passover. Because it would be too far from many of them to get back home and just turn around and come back again between Passover and Pentecost. And so Jerusalem would be uh, overflowing with people and there would be people camped all on the hills surrounding outside the walls of Jerusalem for those uh, feasts. Such a great number of people would come in from all over the world, just as uh, Acts chapter 2 describes. But did some of these then go back home after Pentecost and take the gospel with them? Possibly that's how the church began in Rome. But there were many, apparently, who obeyed the gospel, starting with those 3,000, Acts 2.41, and then the number increasing to 5,000 men by the time you get a couple of chapters further over. And then by the time you get to chapter 6, a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith, and uh, the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. So it was just mushrooming, growing by leaps and bounds. And apparently many of those decided they would just stay in Jerusalem instead of going back home. And you remember there was a great need for uh, the necessities of life in the early days of the Jerusalem church. 
Acts chapter 6, some of the Grecian widows, that is, uh, uh, converted Greeks, their widows were being neglected. At least the accusation was made. And this is where the apostles uh, said, you choose out seven men from among you and appoint them over this matter so that we, the apostles, can continue in our work of preaching the gospel and in prayer. And this is where Stephen and Philip enter the picture as two of those seven men. But there was a need for daily distribution of food among those people, you see. And uh, it's thought often that uh, many of those who came there for the Passover feast and the Pentecost feast obeyed the gospel and they were so thrilled with the fellowship of all of that and the fulfillment of the prophecies that were involved but they just decided to make Jerusalem their home. And while that was happening, some of the men in those households died and left widows. And they were totally with no means of support. <laughs> so there was this perpetual problem of poverty in Jerusalem and the Judean churches because of this. And so years after Pentecost, we're talking about bringing this collection back to uh, the poor in Jerusalem. That's... Uh, 20 years after Pentecost, and the problem is still there. So something uh, very unusual caused all of this uh, long period where there was great poverty, uh, poverty among the Jerusalem saints. So maybe some of those did go back from Rome who had come to Jerusalem for the Pentecost. And then there is another speculation about how the church there began. Uh, after Stephen was stoned to death for his gospel sermon recorded in Acts chapter 7, Saul of Tarsus then led the great wave of persecution against the church, binding men and women and putting them into prison, Paul, Saul, giving his consent to those who were being killed as he had done with uh, Stephen, closing part of Acts chapter 7, getting orders from uh, the Sanhedrin court to go all the way to Damascus, 165 miles north of Jerusalem, because he had heard that there were some Christians up there and they didn't want to let this thing get out of control in other cities like it had in uh, Jerusalem. But the great wave of persecution broke out. Early part of Acts chapter 8 tells us. And verse 4 says, They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the gospel. Now, we don't know exactly how far they scattered from Jerusalem initially. But it is quite possible that some of those scattered from Jerusalem had originally been from Rome. And at that time, they decided uh, they're not going to let us uh, stay here. They're not going to let us preach the gospel here in Jerusalem anymore. We'll go back home and we'll preach the gospel. That is a good possibility of the way the church there began. But here is another way. In uh, Acts chapter 18, Paul comes from Athens down to Corinth. And uh, he doesn't even have any support for his necessities of life. And here's where we find uh, he had been trained as a young man, apparently, to make tents. And you know, tents were a pretty popular uh, commodity in the first century. A lot of people... Uh, needed tents, had tents, lived in tents, and so forth. So um, he somehow found some others who were tent makers, a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. And uh, Paul tells us they had, or Luke tells us, he's giving the record here, they had lately come out of Rome because of the edict of the emperor Claudius that drove all the Jews out of Rome. And so they'd fled to Corinth. Well, when Paul uh, is writing the uh, book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, it's probably six or seven years after when he first came into Corinth and met Aquila and Priscilla. And in his 16th chapter, Aquila and Priscilla are in Rome again. They've gone back to Rome. That edict apparently has been lifted. So in chapter 16, 
Verse 3, Paul says, Salute Prisca, that's an abbreviation for Priscilla, Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles, and salute the church that is in their house. The church was meeting in the house of Aquila and Priscilla in Rome. It may be that they were the ones who first brought the gospel to Rome. Either they or someone else that Paul had converted in some of his travels. But the important thing is not how the church began in Rome as far as people or time are concerned, but that someone had come there and preached the gospel and some had obeyed the gospel and the Lord had added them to his church just as he had done from the beginning on Pentecost in Jerusalem. It was apparently a church of mostly Gentile members from chapter 1 and verse 13. He says, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you and was hitherto hindered, that I might have some fruit in you also, even as in the rest of the Gentiles. So, um, he seems to be saying that uh, you're mostly Gentiles there in that statement. And yet there are indications in the book as well that some Jews made up the church. The great theme, as I mentioned, is justification by faith. And uh, he strikes that theme beginning in uh, verse 16, particularly the first chapter. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And then verse 17, where he says, uh, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, even as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So uh, salvation by faith is uh, the theme until we get through the 11th chapter. And Paul is demonstrating how this has worked and demonstrated how it still worked then and of course how it still works now until we get to chapter 12 and I'll go ahead and give a three point outline now for the book chapters 1 through 11 is the great doctrinal statement of justification by faith and then starting in uh, chapter 12 and going through about the middle part of the 15th chapter we have practical Lessons on living. Faith in practicality. If one is justified by faith, how does this affect his life? How does it cause him to behave? And so chapter 12 is a major break beginning at the first of the chapter. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your minds. That you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so um, here we have the great switch to the practical section. Although doctrinal matter is not impractical, that's not <laughs> the, the emphasis by using that term, practical, for uh, matters of Christian living, but it, it's simply saying how we put into practice now the doctrine that we have been taught. And then from the middle part of the 15th chapter through the end of the book is Paul's closing remarks and greetings to great host of people, especially throughout the entire 16th chapter. So there is a simple three-point outline of the book. I want to spend the rest of our time now on, on this uh, great theme of the book, mainly justification by faith. In the uh, 16th century, we have the great uprising against Roman Catholicism that begins what is called the Reformation Movement. Now there had been attempts to reform Roman Catholicism before then. Even in the 11th and 12th and 13th centuries there had been some uprisings, uh, rebellions against Roman Catholic authority and corruption in the priesthood and in the popes even. Some of them lived the most disgraceful and immoral lives possible. 
And still they were cramming their doctrine down upon the common people. The Bible was generally chained to the pulpits and the cathedrals. Most people could not read it if they had had a copy of it, but only the priests were supposed to be reading it. And so the people were kept religiously enslaved to Roman Catholicism. So every once in a while this, this great religious boil would burst and there would be an uprising against it. But they never had the staying power that they needed to effect any general reforms or cause any real problems to Catholic hierarchy. But a man came along in the 16th century by the name of Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, by the way. <clears throat> but he began studying his Bible instead of just studying the rituals of Catholicism and the creed books. And the more he read and studied, the more he saw that uh, there were major <coughs> flaws, major differences between what was in the Bible and what Catholicism actually was teaching and practicing. This eventuated in the year 1517 of his drawing up a list of 95 points of disagreement he had and he believed the New Testament had with Roman Catholicism. And that document was called the 95 Theses. And he took those and he nailed them to the door of the cathedral in Württemberg, Germany. They were actually a challenge to the Roman Catholic Church to debate him on those issues. Now, usually when somebody engages religious debate over the past two centuries, they might have two propositions, <laughs> one in the affirmative and one in the negative. And they'll spend four nights debating those two. Think what it would take to debate 95 theses, <laughs> 95 <laughs> propositions. And yet that's uh, what Luther did. One of the major things that Luther objected to, he saw that Catholicism was based upon human works. He was uh, extremely upset by the work of John Tetzel, who was an agent for the Roman Catholic Church to go about the European cities where there were cathedrals and sell to them the right to sin in advance of doing it, to raise money to build St. Peter's Cathedral or Basilica in Rome that still stands today. Now the practice of selling those things was called selling indulgences. They were selling the right to sin, or they were indulging sin for so much money. And so that huge uh, cathedral was built. Well, Luther knew that this could not have anything to do with, with the New Testament and what it taught. And so uh, it was just a matter of works. You know, you go to the priest, you confess your sins, and you... You do so many uh, penances, you uh, so many Hail Marys, you write so many, light so many candles, uh, you uh, go through your rosary so many times, and just on and on, the way that you make up for your sins. It's a system of work. You earn your favor of God. And so when Luther got to the book of Romans and he saw, no, we're justified by faith and not by works. Romans 1.17 So that we're justified by faith, even as it is written, the just shall live by faith, and he added a word right there, alone. And he got over to chapter 3 and verse uh, 28 where Paul is contrasting the law of Moses with the gospel of Christ and the system of salvation by faith. So then we are not justified by the works of the law, but by faith only, he added again. 
And so the doctrine of salvation by faith alone was born from the work of Martin Luther in the 16th century. Count up right quickly. Even those who are not math scholars like one among us is. 500 years. We're two years away from 500 years since Luther nailed those 95 theses to that cathedral door. And his dogma, faith only salvation, dominates Protestant theology to this day. Well, <laughs> the Romans letter teaches salvation by faith. Most certainly, but neither the Romans letter nor any part of the New Testament has ever taught salvation by faith alone or faith only. Paul teaches contrary to that in the Romans letter. He tells us his meaning of salvation by faith in the first chapter in the fifth verse when he speaks of the obedience of faith. And then the book end on the other end of the Romans book or letter, chapter 16, verse 26, almost his last words. He repeats the same thing. The obedience of faith. When Paul says we're saved by faith, he does not mean just mentally accepting the fact that Christ is the Son of God, though that's necessary, of course. Except you believe that I'm He, you shall die in your sins, John 8, 24. But he defines what he means by faith in chapter 1, 5, in chapter 16, 26. That it must be something that acts, that obeys. No one can read Romans chapter 6 and come away believing that Paul ever had it in his mind that we're saved by merely believing in Christ. Romans chapter 6 begins the chapter by saying, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It just argued in chapter 5 that uh, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound to take care of the sin. And so he's anticipating an argument that some of them will make, a fallacious argument. The more we sin then, the more grace we'll have. Is that what you're saying, Paul? And so he is cutting the legs out from under that as we begin chapter 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound then? God forbid. And then he goes on in verse 3 and he says, Know ye not that all we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted or buried with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Then he goes on and argues about how in uh, putting sin to death, in dying to sin, we cannot keep living in it. If we've truly repented, we cannot keep on living a sinful life. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Get it off the throne of your heart. Do not be a slave to sin. And with that he introduces the slavehood that should be ours. Verses 17 and 18. God be thanked that ye were the servants or slaves of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart the form of teaching that was delivered unto you. And being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So how could you possibly fit in what he is saying here? You had to obey from the heart a pattern or a form, a mold of doctrine, a standard of doctrine to be free from sin. And still be teaching salvation by faith alone without any act of obedience attached? Just believe in your mind that Christ is the Son of God? 
That's totally foreign to what Paul was teaching. And yet that is what your average, everyday, run-of-the-mill, 99 and 9 tenths percent Protestant preacher is preached today if he's mentioned faith and salvation in the same sentence. But he didn't get it out of the Bible. <laughs> Either Romans or Galatians or anywhere else. And someone may say, well, if he'd just followed that uh, good hermeneutical principle, don't quit reading too soon. Luther would have known better than faith only because he'd get over to James, chapter 2, where James says, so then we are not saved by faith only. Well, Luther did get over there and read that. And what was his uh, opinion of it when he read it? Well, James... The letter of James is a right strawy little epistle. It's not on the same level as Paul's great letter to the Romans. He didn't have the same measure of inspiration that Paul did, and so he just debunked it. Well, do we have a conflict between two inspired writers here, James and Paul? Oh, indeed not. Paul is not saying we're saved by faith alone and no works are necessary. And James is not saying that we can earn our way to heaven by our good works. He's not talking about the good works that we do in trying to attain righteousness with God. He's talking about works of obedience. Which, of course, is what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 6, and then chapters 12, 13, 14, and half of 15, telling us that we must live in a certain way. It's not just by faith alone. But when you get right down to it, those who say we're saved by faith alone, they don't really believe that. Because they require people to repent. And repentance is something besides faith. Are believing. They require people to confess that they believe that Christ is the Son of God. And confession and merely holding faith in one's heart are two different things. Paul makes that clear in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. With the heart, here's the Bible heart up here, man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Well, there were Jews in Jesus' day John chapter 12, who believed in him, even some of the rulers of the Jews, but they would not confess him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. So believing and confessing one's faith are two entirely separate acts. But the main thing they don't want connected with salvation, the faith only people, is baptism. They cannot allow somehow that baptism has anything to do with one's salvation. And so what they do, they take baptism and they say, it cannot be a condition of salvation because then we'd be earning our salvation. It's a human work. Baptism is. And they're wrong about that too. It's a work in which humans are involved, but humans did not come up with baptism. God came up with baptism through his son. It's almost as if uh, inspiration were looking down the stream of time from the first century and knowing that there were going to be those who would make that very argument that baptism is a meritorious work. Paul, in writing to Titus, chapter 3, and verse 5 says, By his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. But before he says that, here is the important thing that he says here. Not by works done in righteousness, which we did ourselves, but according to his mercy he saved us 
through the washing of regeneration. Now, what do you suppose the washing of regeneration is? Is it taking a bath? It's baptism. Where does Paul put it? Over here as a work of righteousness by which he just said we can't be saved by that. No, it's over here part of the mercy of God. By his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. No, baptism was not ordained of man. Man despises baptism. He wouldn't have come up with it. <laughs> He's rejected it. He says it's not necessary. And so passage after passage after passage has to be explained away by those who insist that we're saved by faith alone. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16. Repent and be baptized unto the remission of your sins. Acts 2.38. Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins. Acts 22.16. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3.27. The like figure whereunto baptism doth now also save us. 1 Peter 3, 21. And so go the expressions demanding that one be baptized to receive forgiveness, salvation, remission of sins, washing away of sins, putting on Christ. And it was only after baptism that the Lord added people to his church on Pentecost, Acts 2, verse 47. So Luther, with all the contributions he made in standing up against Catholicism, just about blew it all away by foisting upon religion the damnable doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Well, let's look at one more thing and then <clears throat> we'll stop this afternoon. By no means will we be through. Um, I want us to put some uh, emphasis upon this very practical Christian living section beginning in chapter 12. Um, we not only have it, you know, there's an abrupt change in the, the subject matter from the end of chapter 11 as it's marked in our testaments to the beginning of chapter 12. I don't know about in your Bible, your testament, but um, from chapters 1 through 11, I mean the text is just stacked up. No uh, space between the end of one chapter and the beginning of the next chapter. But at the end of chapter 11, there is about a double space of nothing, and then chapter 12, which indicates the uh, subject matter changes dramatically. I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or spiritual service. And then he says what we quoted earlier, be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world push you into its mold but be transformed. You be a changed people. You were once that way perhaps, but you be a changed people. Transformed people. That you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, in this 12th chapter, a little bit further down, Paul starts giving in staccato fashion almost principles by which we ought to live, starting in verse 9 especially. Let, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. In love of the brethren be tenderly affectioned one to another. In honor preferring one. Think about what those simple principles and the application of them would do in a congregation to prevent turmoil and to prevent jealousy and prevent strife and things of that kind. And think how they will preserve them among the Lord's people who are practicing them. In diligence not slothful, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. 
communicating to the necessities of the saints, given to hospitality, bless them that persecute, bless and curse not. A little later he'll say, avenge not yourselves, dearly beloved. Because the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. It's not our place to avenge ourselves when we are under duress or when we are being persecuted. And then maybe the capstone of those very practical statements, the last one of the chapter, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So many things by which we need to live today. Chapter 13, be in subjection to the powers that be. That is, Christians have an obligation to obey the laws of the land up to a certain point. Up to the very point when those laws would cause us to disobey God, who is the higher authority. And so another very practical uh, lesson there about our, our behavior as citizens. And then chapter 14, the matter of uh, those who have different scruples about things that don't really matter. The case that Paul sets before us is those who uh, eat only herbs, as the New Testament says. We'd call them vegetarians today. But then there are those who eat meat. They're carnivorous animals. I'm one of those. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, it doesn't make any difference to God. And it shouldn't make any difference to you as far as trying to enforce your scruples or force your scruples upon someone else. Live together. Let the veggie eater eat his vegetables, and you veggie eaters, let the meat eaters eat their meat and veggies. And live together in harmony because... Those things don't make any difference. Well, you can plug in all sorts of things besides those two that Paul chose in which we might differ from one another. Color of the carpets, the color of the walls, uh, how many windows or how many doors or how many square feet are we going to buy or all sorts of things. Some brethren might think one thing about it and some brethren might think another thing. Oh, we're spending too much money here. No, we're not spending enough money on that. Well, let's live together on it. As long as it's in the realm of opinion and option, let's compromise on it if we have to. Because those things don't make any difference to God. It's His Word and the things that He's laid down that are unchangeable, that we don't have any options in, that are obligatory where we've all got to speak the same thing and be of the same mind and be perfectly joined together. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, they were disputing over things that were indisputable. They didn't have a right to pick up the preacher and say, I'm going to follow this one over here, and others say, I'm going to follow this one over here. You all follow Christ. You all baptized into Christ. Did Christ die for you? Were you baptized in Christ's name, or in Paul's name? Did Paul die for you? So, uh, the fourteenth chapter is a, an important chapter from that standpoint of just practically getting along in a congregation of people where people have different ideas about different things that don't make any difference. And then, chapter sixteen is a remarkable chapter because it. Um, it gives us a roll call of the names of so many brethren that we would not know otherwise. I was assigned uh, this chapter in a study on the book of Romans, I guess 20 years or more ago at uh, Spiritual Sword Lectures, I believe it was, in Memphis, Tennessee. And I was amazed at how much rich material there is in this sixth chapter of Romans when you really study it. And we find out some things about the life and the family of Paul that we don't know anything, uh, don't have any other source for them. For instance, in chapter 7, in all of his salutations that he's uh, sending, he says, Salute Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners. We don't know whether they were cousins, <laughs> whether they were uh, nephews, uncles. Uh, uh, surely he'd have said brethren if they were that close a relationship, but they were kin to him somehow. And then uh, the 21st verse of that 16th chapter, Timothy, my fellow worker, saluteth you, 
and Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsman. A little bit more about his family. That's all we know about this fellow named Sosipater. You know, we learn a little bit about Paul's family from uh, Acts chapter 23 when he was in uh, prison in Jerusalem. And his sister's son found out about the plot against his life by the 40 Jews who said, we're not going to eat a bite or drink a bite until we kill this man, Paul. And the nephew overheard it, brought the news to Paul, and Paul sent him on to the uh, captain of the guard there, and Paul was rescued. That's when he went to Caesarea. We know that he was not like Timothy who had a Greek father and a Jewish mother because uh, as he wrote to the Philippians, chapter 2, he said, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, right down the line, he was a Jew all the way from birth, from nationality, from religion. And one of great zeal, as we know, when we're first introduced to him, but... Uh, it would be interesting to know more about his family, but these are just little snippets of information. Some of them plugged into the 16th chapter of Rome, uh, Romans here. Uh, sort of incidentally, it almost seems like, as he's sending greetings to all of these people. He just happens to mention some of his kinfolk. Well, one more thing. I've already said that once, I know. <laughs> How does one receive the faith that justifies? Justification is by faith, but how does one receive that faith? John Calvin came along. He was a little bit younger than Martin Luther, but he and Luther were contemporaries. And Calvin ended up having actually more influence from Zurich, Switzerland, than Luther did down in Germany. Luther says we receive faith directly from the Holy Spirit. He sends faith into our hearts. And if we don't believe, it's because we were not foreordained to believe. We were not a part of the elect. God didn't pick us out. And there's not anything he can do about it if that's happened. Paul simply teaches, Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, or the word of Christ. There's not any infusion of faith or infusion of knowledge in any direct way that comes from the Holy Spirit. We don't live in the days of inspiration where God reveals his will to us in a miraculous way as he did to hand-picked individuals until they could get it all written down to last until Christ comes again, which we have in our New Testaments. No, when he got it all written down, it was finished. And 1 Corinthians 13 says the gifts would disappear when it was all fulfilled. That is all written down, all completed. And that's happened, of course. We have the fullness of the revelation of Christ to us. Small in us form, we can stick it in a shirt pocket if we're a man, stick it in a purse and take it with us if we're a lady. Keep it in the glove box of our car. We've got a great advantage over first century Christians in that way. They didn't have a book they could turn to. It was being revealed gradually in their day. And so let's not squander the opportunity to increase our faith by hearing the word of God. Well, we've already called attention to the way that people were justified by faith as seen in the letter to the Romans. They heard the gospel of Christ and it produced faith in their hearts. Faith comes by hearing. But they were required to confess their faith in Christ. With the heart man believeth. Oh, we believe in our hearts, all right. But with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9, and 10. And they were presented with a pattern or form of doctrine which they obeyed and which everyone has to obey to break the shackles of sin both in its practice and its guilt. 
and if faithful until we die or the Lord comes, whichever is first, frees us from the consequences of sin. We'll get to go home and be with God and His Son forever and ever and ever if we will just follow the plan of salvation in the book of Romans. Which requires us, of course, to turn away from a life of sin, be not conformed to this world, and to be baptized into Christ, which reenacts in a figurative way the death of Christ. We must die to sin and repentance. The burial of Christ in his tomb, we're buried in water. And the resurrection of Christ from the dead, we're raised to walk in newness of life. In Christ, in his church, saved by the grace of God. If you need to obey the gospel today, if you need to respond to the gospel invitation, please let us help you do that today. You don't have to come to the front. You can just tell us afterward. We'd be so happy to assist you. We've got a baptistry full of water just yearning to have somebody disturb those waters. Let us help you with that today. While we stand and sing, will you come? Thank you.